He who would valiant be against all disaster, let him in constancy follow the master. There's no discouragement shall make him once relent his first avowed intent to be a pilgrim. Once upon a time, there was a man who was tired. Oh dear. Oh dear, oh dear. He sat in the same chair from dawn till dusk, gazing at the world outside. Harold! Post! Mm. And life, he felt, was like crouching in a jam jar, with the screw-on lid wedged fast on top. The thoughts twitched in his mind, like something drying. I thought I might, uh... What's that? I said, I thought I might do something today. What are you saying? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I probably won't. Oh, there's a postcard here from David. Look, it's from his holiday. Do you want to see? And a letter addressed to you. Worthing, it says. Does that not strike you as odd? Odd? Strange. Should it? Harold, we don't know anyone in Worthing. Still, that's what it says on the stamp. Look, Worthing. Well, you wouldn't think... What, Harold? Well, they'd get a thing like a, a postmark wrong. Well, indeed. <sighs> How's the egg? Not too soft? <laughs> Heaven forbid it should be soft. Once we had eggs and mine was slightly soft and I didn't complain, Maureen. I ate it. And to tell the truth, Maureen... I enjoyed the novelty. You enjoyed the novelty? I think not. You've never bought anything without buying three more of the same. Are you going to read that letter? Oh, yes, yes. Then one day the tired man opened a letter. And in that moment, everything changed. Dear Harold, this letter may come to you as some surprise. Good Lord. It's from Queenie Timms. My old secretary. <coughs> you all right? No, I just got something stuck in my throat. T toast or something. You must remember Queenie Timms. Young girl. Old-fashioned name. Queen of the office. My little joke. <laughs> I see. She was with me for years. Don't you remember? People come and go, Harold. You can't remember everyone. She gave you flowers once. Yes, that's right. Huge white ones. Well, I don't know why she would have done that. Would have been nice. She was just that sort. She liked making people happy. Beautifully typed, of course. And what Queenie didn't know about grammar, you could fit on a postage stamp. Oh, haven't heard from Queenie in, oh, years, have we, Maureen? Good Lord. David said the weather's been terrible. There's a picture of a mountain. That's nice. Harold, a mountain. It's cancer. She's dying, she says. She's just dropping me a line to bid goodbye. I, I'm, gosh. Gosh, I really don't know what to say. Harold, are you all right? Well, if I don't clear the breakfast, it will be lunch, and then we'll be all mixed up. Mr Fry stares at Queenie's letter. The memory of her slips and clings, slips and clings, deep inside him. Harold? Oh, hello. You haven't moved. So I haven't. I don't think I've truly seen you move since you retired six months ago. Tell me, Harold, are you going to spend the rest of your life sitting there? No. Good Lord. Good Lord, no. And now where do you think you're off to, Harold? That morning, Mr Fry carries the stepladder from the garage and climbs it to the loft. 
he notices with some surprise that despite the suddenness of the thing he is about to do, his hands do not shake. What on earth are you doing up there? Yes, it's still here. <laughs> Dear Queenie, have faith, though in what I do not know. Best wishes, Harold. Open brackets, Fry. Close brackets. I'm just going to post a letter, Maureen. That's nice, Harold. Oh, well, take this for me while you're at it. It's a birthday card for David. Oh, what are you wearing? Oh, these? I found them in the loft. They were still in their box, tissue paper and everything. David gave me them years ago. You remember? They fit. Oh, I think not. I think not. Have you looked at yourself in the mirror? I just thought I'd take a walk. Down as far as the post box. Oh, in those space boots. <laughs> I think not. <laughs> Quality walking boots, actually. Well, you won't make it as far as the gate. <laughs> he who would valiant be. It is a bright morning. Puffs of soft cloud are pasted against the tissue paper sky. But as Mr. Fry sets off along Acacia Drive, his heart flaps up and down like a young bird getting to grips with wings. A neighbour stops his mower and frowns. I, I thought I'd take a bit of a stroll, stretch the legs, shake the dust off uh, the old walking boots. <laughs> well, not exactly old, but more like brand new. Bit pinching a bit, actually, on the, uh, oh, on the toes. Well, let's get on, post my letters. There is a pillar box at the end of the avenue. Harold pauses beside it. He lifts the two envelopes as far as the slot, his own for Queenie, the other to his son. And that's when it occurs to him. After all, it's a nice day. I haven't exactly anything else to do. I mean, I might as well go on to the next one. And when he gets there, he finds... Oh, not tired. I think I'll just maybe go on a bit. <laughs> Mr. Fry walks past six more post boxes. He reaches the general post office in the centre of town. Oh, still got some walk left in me. Fancy that. It is not like Mr. Fry to make a snap decision. He sees that now. In all his life, he has not snapped into anything. Creeping in a pair of soft-soled bedroom slippers has been more my style. <laughs> it occurs to him that it is Maureen who phones David. It is Maureen who signs his name, Dad, in the card. It is Maureen... Who's Harold? And it begs the question, if Maureen is Harold... Then who am I? Mr. Fry strides past the next post box without even stopping. Maureen has done the dark wash. She has done the white wash. She has done the medium coloured wash and also the hand wash only. She stands staring at the front door as if commanding it to open. Mr Fry has never walked for so long. And yet, even after a day, he is not far. He could step on a bus and be home in half an hour. It baffles him at first, the slowness of himself. He is used to seeing life trundle past the Persia at the correct 30 miles per hour. But having come thus far, it seems... Shame to go back. A bite to eat, Mr. Fry. Now there's a sensible idea. He buys a burger from the garage, and a girl shows him how to heat it in the microwave. Gosh, I see. Ha-ha! <laughs> That's clever. I've never uh, used one of these things. M my wife, she must be a maid. She, she does all these things. I just, uh, watch. <laughs> well, well, isn't that extraordinary? Mr. Fry tells the garage girl about Queenie's letter and the one inside his pocket. That's the power of positive thinking, she says. If you have faith, you can do anything. Is that so? Do you really think? Oh, yes, she says. My aunt had cancer. I mean, it's everywhere, she says. As if it's part of the furniture. You just have to believe in yourself. And she got better, did she? You're right? Because you all believed she could. The garage girl doesn't exactly answer. 
She gives him the burger and says, put away your money. There aren't enough people like you in the world, she says. Well, I don't know. I've worked for 40 years for the same company selling garden furniture. I'm not exactly going to change the world. Oh, thank you. But the girl has moved away. She is serving someone else. Ah, oh, yes, she says. It's a question of faith, you say. Oh, well. Funny, you know, I mean, it's not a word you normally hear, faith. And you came to me, too, this morning. When life gets tricky, the big words seem to spring to mind. And even though we may not actually know what they mean anymore, they feel right. Like putting a nice sun lounger against an empty wall. They fill the space. <laughs> oh, well. Best be off. Thanks for the burger. <laughs> yes, yeah, all right. Let him in constancy follow the master. Harold? Where in heaven's name are you? Harold? Well, to tell the truth, I, I think I'm a bit lost. I mean, both literally and metaphorically. Oh, well, ho, ho, if you think that's clever. Well, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm coming to the conclusion that I don't know much. Oh, Harold, I've been worried sick. I was about to phone the police. Only I couldn't think how to say it. I seem to have lost my husband, officer. They plain laugh. I'm sorry, Maureen. I didn't realise the time. You didn't realise the time? Well, what have you been doing? Well, just walking, thinking mainly. Tell me, is this a midlife crisis? Because if it is, it's rather late. I've never seen anything so ridiculous as the sight of you this morning. <laughs> Have you still got your socks pulled up over your trousers? And those appalling boots. What I'm trying to say, Maureen, is that when I set out with the letters, I thought I was going to take a walk, to, just to see what it was like, to stop sitting. At least that's what I thought. But the further I went, I, I found I couldn't let them go. The, the letters, I mean. Every postbox I saw, I, I found I wanted to go on a bit. Don't ask me why, but I think I thought that if I took my letters to Queenie myself, that might be something I could do. I might, well, I don't know, save her. You're going to see Queenie Timms to save her from cancer? I admit it sounds far-fetched. The girl at the garage said, it's a question of faith, she said. I mean, maybe if, if you believe you can do something, you, you really can. Oh, I think not. <laughs> and what about David's birthday card? Are we delivering that personally as well? <laughs> oh, I think not. <laughs> you always laugh at me. Whenever I say anything you don't like, you make that funny face so that your eyes disappear somewhere into your cheeks and you say, I think not. You never, ever agree with me. Harold? I've wasted a lifetime staring at a patio furniture. Oh, well, <laughs> if you feel you've wasted a lifetime... <laughs> oh, well, heavens above, that's fine, then. If you feel all those years that you've spent married to me have been wasted, well, then go. Yes, go. Walk away to Queenie, why don't you? Might I remind you that I, too, have wasted a lifetime looking after you? Maureen, that is not what I meant. Harold, the neighbours were staring out of their front room windows when I had to carry out the rubbish. I had to pretend you were asleep upstairs. And now you ring me at this time, telling me you've wasted your life and expecting me to just drop everything and come and fetch you. But I'm not coming back. I mean, not yet. I'm walking. What do you mean, you're not coming back? I'm awfully sorry, Maureen, for, for the inconvenience to you. I mean, I really am awfully sorry. Harold, come home this minute. Harold, are you in a phone box? Uh, yes. It's quite smelly, actually. I believe someone may have... Well, where's your mobile? Well, it's upstairs, in my jacket pocket. I didn't know I was going to walk, you see. Harold? Harold? <sighs> that night he is too exhausted to speak. He falls asleep in his takeaway fish and chips. Mr Fry has passed 33 post boxes, one sorting office and several delivery vans. He takes a room in a small B&B &B where there is a single bed and a television attached at eye level to the wall. Rise and shine, Mr. Fry. Stretch your foot. Oh, crap. 
towards you, Mr. Fry. Towards you? Not away. Yes. He is a little stiff in the legs. And his boots, when he reaches for them, no longer seem to fit. What you need, Mr. Fry, is a good breakfast. Sugary tea? How do you like your eggs, sir? How do I like my eggs? Soft boiled. Ten miles away, oh. Maureen opens her eyes. Oh. Sunlight frames the bedroom curtain like oh. a shiny trimming. She smiles because it is another day. And then she remembers. Harold? She searches every room as if half expecting him to leap out and surprise her. Harold? Is that you? Harold? Harold? Oh, come here this minute! The house is stiller than still, emptier than empty. On the second day, Mr. Fry crosses the bridge spanning the estuary. On the third day, Mr. Fry makes it as far as the next cathedral town. He takes the opportunity to visit a camping shop where he buys... A rucksack, compass, sun hat, flask, waterproof mat for sitting on, also ordnance survey maps, packets of dried fruit, oh, Kendall mint cake, spare socks, uh, and th oh, thank you, a sleeping bag in case of emergency. <laughs> What's this thing? A mobile to hang at your window. Stars and chimes and a oh, tiny silver moon. Like a world we can't touch. Yes, yes, I'll, I'll take this uh, hanging mobile th uh, thingamajig. W would you mind wrapping it? It's for a friend. Oh, Mr. Fry. By the fourth day, Mr. Fry has walked 40 miles in a southerly direction. He has... Blackache. Shoulder ache, arm ache, leg ache, constant buzzing in my ear, plasters on my toes, cream between my toes, two pairs of socks to prevent rubbing, and I've narrowly missed being run over on a number of occasions. Three lorries, one motorbike, two sports cars, and a camper van have all taken a shot at me. That afternoon, Mr. Fry breaks from the road and heads for the hills. Maureen spreads Harold's suits on the bed and reaches for her pinking shears. Wronged wives do these things. She read it once in a magazine. She opens the blades and watches the way sunlight reflects on the jagged teeth. Harold's wedding suit, too small now at her fingertips. It smells of... Something long ago. Mothballs. Maureen replaces the uncut suits in his wardrobe and creeps wordless down the stairs. There's an ocean between love and power. Oh. She sees it now. For oh, goodness sake, why doesn't something go and happen? Now, according to my map... The path is that way. Car, right up there. Oh, I should manage that. Good Lord. Blue flowers. <laughs> Look at that. Like a carpet. <laughs> Do you remember sometimes you'd, you'd walk into the office and I'd be all glum because maybe a, a new order hadn't arrived in yet? And you'd say, flowers, Mr. Fry, what this place needs is flowers. <laughs> do you remember? Oh, Mr. Fry, I do. You'd, you'd, you'd run off laughing, and you'd bring them in great armfuls. Don't you remember? Yellow ones and red ones of all sorts. And I did, did not say, at least I can't remember saying, things were so busy at that time. It's ironic that it takes a walk 30 years later to remember that I did not say thank you. Blimey, it didn't look like this from the bottom. Kendall Mint Cake, Harold? 
I don't mind if I do. Mmm, <laughs> delicious. Maureen doesn't like flowers. Give me something useful, she say. Something that doesn't die. Like a pen. <laughs> a pen. Oh, ball points. Those ones with the nib that go in and out if you press the tops. Colouring pens, both sparkly and plain. <laughs> if it's a special occasion, <laughs> I buy her a bumper pack. She keeps them in small pots on all the windowsills. <laughs> Good Lord, hang, hang on a minute. I've got to get my breath back. Suddenly the ground seems to shift beneath his feet. Ah! Mr. Fry feels his stomach spring to his mouth oh. and his hands reach out as if to grab an invisible handrail. And the joy Mr. Fry feels at regaining his balance on this stony crevice is so big he is breathless. Good. Good Lord. Good heavens above. He fits inside his legs and his torso. He is not stuffed inside an office chair or the driver's seat in the Peugeot. He is not staring through the window at the chipped pots on the patio. It is like moving for the first time in his life without a safety belt. This is fantastic. Hi! Um, Harold Fry. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Mr. Fry knows he could climb mountains, peak after pointed peak. So much dust, oh, everywhere, in the carpet and behind the cushions and under the freezer. Even when you're not flaming here, you make dust. Oh, the view up here. Hello, hills. Hello, sky. It's like seeing forever. It's like the nearest thing to touching heaven. I did it. I never thought I could, but I can, you see. And the air is, oh, it's stuff you could drink. It's so sweet. I was right. If you truly believe in something, you can do it. There is such a thing as faith. It's alive and well and kicking about on mountaintops. So hang on in there, Queenie, because everything is going to be hunky-dory. And listen out. This... This is a sound you won't have heard before. This is the sound of Harold Fry running. Hey! <laughs> Look at me! Look at me! Have faith, Queenie! He's first of old intent. How are you, Maureen? Well, not good as it happens. The shower's leaking all over the floor, and I, I don't know why, because it's simply not supposed to. Yes, I miss you too. I miss you so much. I feel chopped up, but thank you for asking, all the same. How nice to know you care. Mr Fry walks for five more days. At night, he sleeps like a babe. He takes money from the cash machine and does not press yes for balance inquiries. He meets other walkers and compares notes on routes. At night he drinks beer with strangers he does not know. What a thing to do, they say, hearing his story. It's my belief, you see, that Queenie knows I am walking for her, in her head. And knowing it, she will get better. Hmm. The human mind's a bigger thing than we know. The following day, Mr. Fry buys himself some specialist walking equipment. He has a visor for the sun, as well as a new blue jacket with fluorescent strips and matching jogging trousers. 
I'm looking for your best walking attire, the sort of thing a professional would wear. Someone like, you know, Ian Botham. Now, what do you have in the way of waterproof gaiters? Mr. Fry cuts a fine figure strolling through the town. He catches his reflection in shop windows, and he likes the person he's seeing. Upright, confident, a man who knows what he's about. He likes the definite sound his boots make on the pavement. And then he notices someone else, further behind, slower than him. Maureen, what are you doing here? I, I was just driving past. You know, I, I, I was passing. Well, well, what a funny coincidence. Isn't it? Maureen, you, you're not crying. I don't suppose you have the time for a cup of tea. They sit opposite, not side by side. And even though Maureen has drunk tea with Harold for 40 years, her hands shake as she pours. Do you uh, take sugar these days? Oh, I just got, got something in my eye. Do, do you want my hanky? Oh, I'd better hang on a moment. Fold over the nanky bit. There you go. It, it's just seeing you at last. You look so well. You too, Maureen. No, Harold. I look like someone left behind. Oh, oh I am crying. All right, I'm crying. It, 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 it's just the, the house is so quiet. Everything is exactly where I leave it. I mean, I, I, I put down a magazine or the crossword or something, and, and, and when I come back, no one's filled in all the easy answers. And I, I know it should be nice to be so tidy. I, I know I'm always going on about it, but oh, I don't know. It isn't. I'm not used to so much stillness. I want you to come home. Did you hear me? Uh, you don't have to decide now, Harold. You, you could decide later. After tea, you, you could decide. Garden's good. Good. Showers leaking the other day, all over the floor. I rang a plumber. Fix now. Mm. Oh. Harold, when I said to you on the phone that day that you should go, no. I didn't really mean that you should go. I, w I was just saying it to make you come back. Maureen, I feel the best I've ever felt in my life. Is that a no, then? In the olden days, people did pilgrimage for holy relics, bits of ear and whatnot. They did it because they believed those outside things were so big that they would heal their pain. They, they would provide the answer. And these days, it's, it's just the same. You see? <laughs> we're still pilgrims. We just don't call it that. We might be up in the hills or gazing at shop windows, but we're... We're still out there looking, searching for something to believe in. I, I don't understand why a person would say they were going for a walk to post a letter and then not come back. We know so much these days, what the technology and the internet and whatnot. But the more we know, the less it all fits together. Queenie was different. If things were going wrong at work, she'd say, cup of tea, sugary biscuit. And I hate so things got better. She had faith, you see. When I first met you, we couldn't stop laughing. Do you remember? <laughs> we laughed on the bus all the way home. And when we looked up, we were almost at the depot and you said... What did I say? Well, I... I don't remember. Y you said something. Did I? Well, you must have done. D don't you remember? We, we laughed and laughed. Didn't we, Harold? We never stopped laughing. 
Sometimes it was as if we were the only people who got the joke. <laughs> you called me Maureen in those days. And then one day it turned to Mo. And after that, for many years, you called me Love. These days it's plain Maureen again. Are you walking to Queenie or to get away from me? Well, I better get back. Cats need feeding. And the other day there was a leak in the shower room. I rang a plumber and fixed. Yes, fixed now. Oops, I. I <laughs> yeah, you got it. Waterproof plasters. Just in case. Oh. You know, Maureen, you could come with me. We could walk together. I think not. I think not. Mr Fry walks for three more days. The sun warms his back, and there are times, he has to admit, when he should be happier than he has ever been. He is fitter. Oh, yes. Fulfilled at last. That too. But since walking away from Maureen, his feet tread more heavily. The days drag. The hills are too high. The thoughts in his head are chained like dogs to one of the past. And that's when he finds it. The thing in the roadside. Good Lord. Whatever's that? Don't stop, Mr. Fry. It's nothing. Well, it was clearly something, Queenie. No, no, you don't want to go looking at that. What on earth? But Mr. Fry stoops right over it and peers. Move on, would you? Looks rock hard. I mean, if that were a stuffed toy, you'd look at that and say, no, no, it's got too much stuffing. A cup of tea? Oh, stop fussing, woman. Three paws, one hacked off. Head all lopsided like someone snapped it. Oh, come away from us, would you? So dead it looks ridiculous. Dog, maybe? Badger? Oh, less than dead. Too dead. As if it was never anything. Good Lord, Queenie. Good Lord. It was only an animal. But the life should come to that. Stiller than still. Emptier than empty. Come along, there might be a view soon. For three more days he walks. Bloody rain. I hate rain. Oh, oh. Oh, I've got soggy feet now. Mr. Fry abandons the hills and plans a more direct route alongside the A roads. Trucks roar past so fast he feels stationary. Worse, he feels. I think you'll miss me. <laughs> oh, God. Kendall Mint Cake? Shut up. Mr. Fry eats food because he has to. He sleeps because he might as well. And if anyone asks, where are you heading? He replies, I, I don't honestly know. I'm a long way from home. I know that much. I'm sorry. I think I may smell... I don't normally uh, smell, I mean. <laughs> I've been out so long, the smell of me doesn't seem to wash off. Can you hear me? Harold, it's gone 11. Where are you? In, in a phone box somewhere. It's raining, Maureen. I want to come home. Can I come home, Maureen? You want to come home? You still there? Yes, Harold. I'm here. I can't do it. I can't do it, Maureen. I can't do it. Are, are you in a town? Harold? Wh where are you? Uh, are you in a town? Uh, I, I don't know what it's called. I've, I've given up looking. I want you to find a hotel. A, a nice one, mind. Can you see anything like that around you? I think I passed one... I... I didn't see the name, though. I... It had steps, marble steps. I remember that. Oh, well, that's good, Harold. Now, you must go there. Uh, and you'll meet me? You, you started this thing, Harold. You've got to finish it. It's supposed to be a nice day tomorrow. On the weather forecast, they slap those happy sun shapes all over the country. 
You'll feel differently tomorrow. No. Good night, Harold. Oh, Harold. <laughs> Childlike, Harold does as Maureen tells him. He takes a room that night with a south-facing window, although he does not trouble himself to lift the curtain. For three more days, Harold walks. His head is empty. Walk. It is simply a matter Walk. now of putting one foot in front of the Walk. other. Walk. Cup of... No, thanks. And then, in a wink of silence, he hears... The sea. I can see the sea. I can smell it. At 20 past 11 on a Wednesday, Harold reaches the hospital. It is 28 days since he left the house in which he has been sitting for years. He is thinner, browner. He limps because the skin of his ankle is so puffed it grows over the heel of his boots. And he is something more. Wiser? He does not know. Yes, uh, hello, nurse. I, uh, I'm H Harold Fry. I've walked an awfully long way to, to save Queenie Timms. Uh, the door appears to... stuck. Awfully sorry. Would you mind, you know, buzzing it again? Because I, I... Oh! Oh, thank you. Yes. Yes, I'm, I'm inside now. An hour passes. Alone, a broken figure sits on a bench outside the hospital. And the sky is so deep and grey, and the sea so deep and grey. It is impossible to tell where one begins and the other ends. Harold? Hello. Harold, did you see her? Yes. She didn't say anything. I left her present by the bed. What shall I call it? You know, the, the mobile thing. I wasn't long. So, was she pleased? Was she surprised? Well, how was it, Harold? What happened? The nurse kept calling me Henry. Isn't it nice that Henry's come all this way? <laughs> Did you hear that, Queenie? Henry actually walked here. First I said, it's uh, Harold. <laughs> but after that I stopped. Didn't seem worth it, being me. Did Queenie smile? No. No, I don't believe she did. I should never have come. I should have posted my letter. The letter would have sufficed. If I'd stuck to the letter, I could have... What? Said it better. The way Queenie would have said it once. Beautifully. No one should die alone in a hospital. It's, it's too hard. Hard floors, hard bed. Hard light. Even sound is hard. Still, I'm surprised she didn't say anything. She has no tongue. I beg your pardon? I believe they cut it out. Along with half her throat, and also the top of her spine. Her face is all puffed, and her hair brushed up somehow in the wrong direction. So that you'd think she'd been sitting for a long time in a violent wind. She looks like someone else, like someone I've never met before in my life. And she scares me. Oh, Harold. <laughs> there were no words to say to Queenie. And what had seemed like such a good idea for all those days seemed ridiculous. I'm the sort of person who thanks the speaking clock. What difference am I ever going to make? After you'd gone, Harold, I was angry, and I was sad. And then I cleaned the house from top to bottom. I vacuumed it up. Oh, it started with the little things, like the odd hair bits of tissue, but by the end it was socks, 
newspapers, photographs even, all sucked away. I thought it would make it better, but it didn't. Because you can't make everything in life nice. Oh, well, what I'm trying to say is that some things in life are just all elbows, Harold. And that's the truth. Would you... Would you hold my hand? Yes. <laughs> she was just such a good woman, Mo. If anything was wrong, she'd say, come... I know. I know. One day... One day will happen to you and me. And who's to say how it will be? And far away, a child will be asking for a, a lollipop. All in the same moment. As if it amounted to the same thing. Oh, boy, I just, I just don't understand. You dear man. You dear, dear man. You got up out. And you did something in good faith. You did it. And if trying to find a way through all the mess and the uncertainty, if, if, if trying to find a way isn't good, well, then I don't know what is. I love you, Harold Fry. That is what you did. Queenie stares at the blurring curtain and sees a mobile that was not there before. Sun and moon and spangly stars. Shapes cut out and spinning above her and sending a myriad of colour dancing on the wall. She is almost nothing. She is a speck. And if you blink a moment, she'll be gone. Oh, but thank you, Harold, for coming. Once she was Queenie. She sang songs and made sugary tea. And though these things mean little, they are in the air. We touch life. We tassel it a little, mess it with our hands. But it's a slippery bugger. And finally, we must close the door and leave everything as it was before. I am so tired. Mo, hmm? I've no idea why I'm remembering this now, but that night on the bus, mm -hmm. when we laughed like kids... Oh, what was it you said? It wasn't what I said. It was you. You turned to me. Oh, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> A memory of something long forgotten. It is so close. Queenie can almost taste it. And when it comes, it comes and... It is as small as breathing. Well, there it is. To Be a Pilgrim by Rachel Joyce Starring Anton Rogers, Anna Massey and Neve Cusack Directed by Tracy Neal First broadcast on BBC Radio 4 in 2007